Hello there, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about the Area 2D node and how it can be used in Godot. The Area 2D node is a commonly used tool in any designer's toolbox. The node can be used to detect when two objects are intersecting each other and send signals to a script on what should happen with this interaction. The Area 2D node can also be used in conjunction with Godot's robust rigid body 2D system to allow for some more complex simulations, including gravity, manipulating linear and angular velocity. For today's video, we will look at four common use cases of the Area 2D node, using a simple project to start with. Today's project will have a simple four-directional movement system, and we'll use Area 2D nodes as the source for pickups, context information, hit and hurt boxes, and mouse interactions. Let's get started. The beginning project can be found at the GD Quest GitHub page. I'll include a link to that in the description down below. To start out, we have a top-down player controller that can move our player in four directions. We also have several objects in the scene. However, none of these objects are interactable with the player at the moment, with the exception of the sign, because the sign currently has a static body attached to it. However, the interaction we want is not currently working. Let's build these interactions now. When working with 2D physics in Godot, the first thing you want to do is create a layer system so that your objects are only interacting with other appropriate objects. To do this, go to Project Settings, then find the Layers tab on the left-hand side of the window that pops up, go to 2D Physics, and for this example I've created five different layers. One for the player, one for the coin, one for the sign, one for the spikes, and another one for general obstacles for our player. Opening up our player scene, let's discuss a little bit about how this player is currently constructed and what we're going to do in order to make the layers happen with the player. Currently the player has a kinematic body as its main node with a collision shape for that kinematic body's movement. That can be seen as the light blue square at the bottom that encompasses the player's shadow. There's also a sprite which encompasses the graphic for the player. There's a hurt box which can be seen down below as the darker blue square. That also has a collision shape and there's an extra scene for what we're going to call a context bubble. More on that later. Now it's important to differentiate the difference between a hurt box and the player's physics collision layer. A hurt box is there to specifically decide when the player has been hit by something in the scene and represents the player's entire body. However, the collision shape that is being used for the kinematic body 2D should be thought of more as the player's feet and is being used to detect when the player is intersected with geometry that should limit its movement, such as walls or doors or other players or NPCs in some, ca some cases. Now, the first interaction we're going to build is going to be between the player and the coin. To do this, let's open up the coin scene. Now let's take a look at those physics layers. Currently, the coin scene is built out of an area 2D node, a collision shape which is a child which defines what the area actually is, and a sprite which represents its actual presence in the world. If we highlight the main node and then take a look at the inspector on the right hand side, we can make sure that the layer and the mask properties are set correctly for our coin. We want our coin to be on the coin layer, so let's make sure that coin is highlighted and that player is not, because the coin is not a player. And for mask, this is what the coin is going to interact with. Let's make sure that the player layer is highlighted. Now you don't need to do both of these. You could just have this as masked to interact with the player, and that would be enough. Or, conversely, if you had its layer set to be coin, and you had the player masked to interact with the coin, that would also be enough. Personally, I like to set them both, just to make sure, but it's not necessary. Back in the player scene, let's do the same thing for both our physics body, the root kinematic body 2D, and also the hurt box. Now with our player's physics body, currently, by default in Godot, everything ends up being on layer 1. So we're making sure that it's on the player layer, which is good. But it should be masked against not the player, but rather the coin, signs, spikes, and obstacles. We're going to make sure the box is on the player layer, and then for the mask, we're going to have it masked only against the spikes, because the spikes are the only thing in our current scene that can hurt us. If we were to add enemies, or, I don't know, angry X's or something like that to the scene, maybe we could mask it for those as well. But for this example, we're just going to leave it masked for the spikes. Going back to our coin scene, we're going to use a signal that the area 2D node has to check to see if a physics body has entered that area. 
To do that though, we first need to make sure that our main Area 2D node has a script attached to it. So with the coin highlighted on the right hand side over in the inspector, I'm going to go down to the script property and create a new script. In this case, I'm not going to inherit from anything. I'm just going to have this be a new script called coin, which I'm going to save in the same folder as the coin itself and create. When you create a new script, Godot creates a lot of pre-built functions for you. In this example, we're not going to need any of them. So I'm just going to highlight these and delete them. Now back in the coin scene, again with the main area 2D node highlighted, I'm going to go to node and we're going to be using the body entered signal in this case. Now you'll notice that there's also an area entered signal. Area entered would be for if another area 2D node had entered this area 2D. However, since the player's feet is a physics body, we need to use body entered. So I'm going to select that and I'm going to connect. And I'm going to connect this to our coin, which means to connect it to the script that I just created. Okay, so I've replaced the function that was there with a new function. Now, all this function is going to do is check to see if a physics body has entered the area 2D, and if so, we're going to queue the coin free. Now, one thing that you'll notice that's going to be different between mine and probably yours is that my version is typed. By making your GD script type, you're typed, you're going to make your program and your functions operate much more efficiently as far as Godot is considered. Now, to make this typed, rather than just having the body, which is the main argument that Godot sends with a function like this, I'm going to tell it that that body needs to be a physics body 2D, and I'm also going to tell it that it's going to return nothing or void, which is what the point of the slash and the greater than symbol there is for. Okay, so now our game is running. I'm going to run over the coin, and you can see that it disappeared as soon as it interacted with my physics body. All right, let's take a look at the interaction between the player and the sign now. Now, let's open up the sign scene. In the sign scene, again, we want to make sure that our sign is on the correct layer and that it is not considered a player and that it is masked against the player. Again, since the player has that mask function, you really only need to make sure that this sign is on the correct layer. Um, however, I, I like to do both. Now, taking a look back at the player, we have a context bubble seen here that is a child of the player that is currently set to be invisible. If you click the eyelash to the right, you can see that it turns on. You can also see that there's a new green collision mask down at the bottom. This is going to be a collision mask for whether or not that context bubble should turn on or off. So I'm gonna turn it back to invisible. I'm gonna open up this context bubble in its own scene. Now, the context bubble itself is another area 2D node with a child of a sprite and a collision shape 2D. If I turn this on, you can see that we've got our sprite and our collision shape at the bottom. I'm gonna turn it back off though. Now, what I want to happen is when this area enters a sign, I want to turn that context bubble. I wanna make it visible. And when we leave the sign, I wanna make it invisible. So to do this over on the right hand side, Again, I'm gonna make sure that this is masked to interact with the sign, which if we go back to our sign here, we wanna make sure that our area 2D is on the sign layer. Now, to create a new script, I'm gonna go over to the inspector and find the script. I'm gonna create a new script. This isn't going to inherit from anything. It's gonna go in the player folder, which is where this context bubble scene is as well, and I'll just create it. Again, I'm going to delete the pre-built functions. Now, as far as the signals that we're going to use for this, with the area 2D highlighted, we're gonna to go to node, and we're gonna be using area entered because this is an area 2D. So I'm gonna connect the area entered signal to the context bubble, and I'm also gonna connect the area exited signal to the context bubble. I'm gonna replace these pre-built functions. Now I've replaced the pre-built functions with Again, typing it so that it knows that area needs to be an area 2D and that it will not return anything, so it's void. If we enter the area, we're just gonna say self.visible is true, meaning this object. And if we exit the area, we're gonna say self.visible is false. Let's test this out. Now in our scene here, if I go over to where my sign is, when that area enters, 
that invisible area that the sign has decided is its range, we see this little context bubble pop up over our player's head. Now, let's do the spike trap next. Okay, opening up the spike trap scene here, we want to do the same thing again. We want to make sure that this is on the correct layer and that it's uh, going to be able to interact with the player, either through its own mask or through the player's mask. So for the spikes, I'm going to make sure that they're on the spikes layer and not the player layer. And I'm also going to make sure that they're masked against the player so that they're going to be interacting with the player's layer. Again, over here on the player, I want to make sure that the player themselves is not masked against the spikes, which is a mistake I made earlier. However, their hurt box should be masked against the spikes. Now, that's all that we have to do as far as the spike trap itself goes. The rest of the interactions are going to be programmed inside the player. So let's go back to our player scene here. Back in our player scene, we're going to add two new nodes in order to handle our knockback functions. First, we're going to have a timer to tell the player for how long they should be knocked back. Second, we're going to be adding a tween to actually override the movement of the player during the knockback phase. Let's add those two nodes now. Okay, with those two nodes named, now let's take a look at our player script. Inside of our player script, all that we're currently doing is checking to see what the input is, and then taking that input and translating it into a normalized vector. Now, normalizing the vector in this case is important because if it's a diagonal vector, you want to make sure it has the same length as if it's in one of the cardinal directions, left, right, up, or down. So adding the dot normalized at the end of changing what our direction is, is allows us to make sure that it's always going to be the same length and the same speed. Otherwise, you might notice that your player is moving much more quickly on the diagonal than they would if they were going in one of the four cardinal directions. Then we're taking that direction, multiplying it by our player's speed, and moving our player in whatever that direction was using the move and slide function. Now, in order to create the knockback, first we're going to need to make an on ready reference to our timer and our tween node. So let's do that first. All right, so here we have a reference to both our stun timer and the tween. And we're again using the typed GD script to do that. Next, we need to make sure that we're getting a signal from the player as to whether or not that hurt box has been entered by something that it should register, in this case, the spikes. Back in our player scene, hurt box. Over here, node, we want to connect the area entered 2D signal to our main player script. Now, what's going to happen in this area entered 2D is a few things at once. First, we're going to be determining the direction upon which our player should be knocked back. We're going to start that stun timer, and then we're going to call a function to make the tween actually move the player in the direction we want them to be moved. Okay, so changing that function here, again, we're making it typed, telling it that the area has to be an area 2D and that this function will not return anything, meaning it's void. Then we're going to determine the knock direction by taking our player's position, subtracting from it the position of whatever it overlapped, and normalizing that vector. Then we're going to call a stun function that I haven't written yet. And then we're going to call a knockback function that's going to take that knock direction uh, as an argument, which I also haven't written yet. So first, let's take a look at what the stun function is going to be. So the stun function is going to take a duration as an argument. However, it's going to have a default value, meaning that if the duration doesn't have a value that's assigned by the function when it's called, then it's going to be 0.3. It's going to set the stun timer's wait time, meaning how long the timer is, to that duration, and then it's going to start the timer. Our knockback function is going to take a direction, which has to be a vector 2 as a value. It's going to give a generic distance of 100.0. Now we could change this to make it so that some things knock back more than others by passing in another argument for our knockback force. However, for this example, this is about as far as I think it's okay to go. Then we're going to take the tween's interpolate property, making sure it's applying to the self, meaning the player in this case. The property it's going to change is position. We're going to start at the player's current position. We're going to end at the position plus direction times distance, meaning we're going to knock back a specific amount along a specific direction. It's going to take 0.3 seconds. I have found that the sign tween looks pretty good for a knockback, and then we're going to ease out of it. Then start the tween. Now, the last thing that we need to do is make sure that our player isn't able to override the knockback during that small amount of time. 
Now we could use a Boolean value to do this. However, since we already started that timer, we don't even need to check for the timeout signal. We can just check to see whether or not the timer is running. So in our move function here, we're going to add a check to see whether or not the timer is running. If it's not, then we'll allow our character to move. Now in this case, we're only going to move our player if the stun timer is stopped, meaning that when it's done, it's done. Now also, since we're using that is stopped function, we want to make sure that our timer, our stun timer, is set to be a one shot, meaning it's only going to run for one time, so it's not going to run continuously again and again in the background. Let's test this out. Okay, so now if I go down to my spike trap here, notice that it's not detecting the sprite itself. Instead, the actual detection for the hurt box was about halfway down our player. So there we go. We've got a nice little knockback there. Now, you'll notice that this feels like that spike is actually a physical object, meaning that it's a static body like the sign. However, it's not. All that's happening is we're detecting for when the area is overlapping and then using that to make sure that we're overriding our player's input on the actual character in the scene. Now, for the last thing that we're going to do, we're going to take a look at how we can create some mouse entered and mouse exit signals for that color square in the bottom right hand corner. Now, taking a look at the color square, this is again an area 2D with a collision shape and a sprite. In this example, I just want to check to see if the mouse is over it, and if it is, I want it to change color. Now again, that could be anything you want other than changing color. It could be changing color and playing a sound, having a little bit of an animation, having it trigger something else to happen in the scene. I just want to check to see if the mouse is over. Now to do this, we don't need to actually set any of our collision layers, but we do need to make sure that this is monitoring and monitorable. With our color square, we're going to need to use the signals, which means this needs to have a script. So with our color square area 2D highlighted, we're going to create a new script. And again, I'm just going to put this in color square and not inherit from anything. I'm going to delete the predetermined functions. Now I'm going to be using the mouse entered and mouse exited. If you highlight the area 2D, go to node, you can see that we have signals for area 2D, but we also have signals for collision objects. Now those collision object signals do not appear if you just use a collision shape. You have to have a node that uses the collision shape to do something. The collision shape on its own is not enough to get these input events mouse entered or mouse exited. So I'm going to connect both the mouse entered signal to our color square and the mouse exited signal to our color square. Now, neither of the mouse entered or mouse exited signals will take arguments. However, I'm I am going to make sure that these are returning a void, meaning that they're not returning anything, so that they take up slightly less processing power. I'm also going to determine two colors, one for when the mouse is over the square and one for when the mouse is not over the square. I'm going to make these exports so that I can easily set them in the inspector. Now, all the functions need to do is change the modulate property of the area 2D in order to change the color to be what I want it to be when the mouse is over or when the mouse is not. Now that I've done that, I just need to go back and change the two colors in the inspector. By default, Godot sets those colors to be pure black and completely transparent. So with my color square highlighted, I'm going to find my two new colors. Uh, my mouse exit is going to be white. Oops, sorry, that's mouse over. My mouse over color is going to be kind of a tealy blue, and my mouse exit is going to be white. Now with those two colors decided, let's try this out. Okay, so here we are. And if I mouse over, it turns blue. Mouse out, it turns back to white. Okay, so today we've looked at how we can use an area 2D to create power-ups, how we can use an area 2D to create context information in the scene, how we can use it to create traps and a knockback function, as well as mouse interactions. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. Otherwise, I hope everybody has themselves a wonderful day.